Hi everyone, my name is Claire Tomlin and I'm a professor in electrical engineering and computer sciences at Berkeley. And what we're starting today is a series of modules to support the material in the course, Linear System Theory, which is a graduate course in electrical engineering at Berkeley, the EECS 221A course. And what we've decided to do is to create these modules, um, short modules, which support the material, the linear algebra concepts, and the basic linear systems concepts in the course. So it's material that we teach in class, but we also have this online facility to help out students in the class or students who are not in the class. What we're going to do in this first module is present the very basic introduction to functions, and we're going to look at properties of injectivity, surjectivity, and bijectivity. That will be the topic of this first module. So let's start with um, just an introduction to functions. So throughout these modules, we're going to use the terminology functions and maps synonymously. So when I say maps, I mean functions. When I say functions, I also mean maps. So what is a function? We start with two sets of elements, two sets of elements, and we're going to define a function which maps elements from one set into this other set. Okay, so let's represent it in terms of this bubble diagram. And we'll use the terminology capital X and capital Y to represent the set X and the set Y. And we'll define a function, f, which maps elements of x to elements of y. So we use the notation f colon x, y to mean that f maps x into y. What does into mean? It means that if we take all of the elements of x and we map it through f, we're going to get, in general, some subset of y over here. I'm going to write that as f of capital X. OK, so some terminology. X is called the domain of f. Y is called the codomain of f. And this set, f of capital X, is called the range of f. is the range, the range of f. So let's write that specifically, range of f. And we, we define it as we did. So we can define it mathematically as all points f of little x such that little x belongs to the domain, capital X. So it's a set of elements. Um, uh, a couple of things are important about this definition of function. First of all, that um, in general, the range is not equal to the codomain. So that's important, that we have x, f mapping x into y. But by definition of a function, it's important to note the following, that this notation here, for this to be a function, what we mean is that for all elements x, so I've got little points, let's call it x over here. So for all elements x in the set x, f assigns a unique value f of x to that. So we we'll might write that over here. So f of x, it belongs in the range. So that point over there is f of little x. Okay, And so the function is assigning a unique value f of x for each x. That is important, that that be unique. So that disallows things like this. Suppose that the domain is the real line and the, the codomain is the real line. Then we, we don't allow ourselves to have relationships sort of that look like this S, for example, where for a particular X, I've got three values of f associated with that. And those three values are not equal to each other. OK, so this is not a function. Not a function. OK, so that's the basic definition of a function and the sets, the names of the sets associated to the function. Let's talk about three properties of functions now. The first is injective, the next is surjective, and the third is 
both properties together, which is called bijective. So what do we mean? What are these, what are these properties? Well, let's start with injectivity, injective. So a function is said to be injective, or what it's commonly known as, as one-to-one. -one. So a function is said to be injective if, and I'll use this notation here, the double implies, or if and only if, which is also written as an IFF -F for if and only if. If and only if the following property holds. If f of x1 is equal to f of x2, that implies that x1 is equal to x2. Okay, so that's by definition of injectivity. So you can see why it's called one-to-one, -one, that the, um, the only way that we could have uh, f of x1 not being equal to f of x2 is if x1 is not equal to x2. So we can write that in the following way. So that's equivalent to saying that x1 not equal to x2 implies that f of x1 is not equal to f of x2. Okay, so these two are equivalent to each other. Injectivity. So surjectivity is the following. A function is said to be surjective, or more commonly known as onto, if, if and only if, for all elements in the codomain, there's an element over in the domain that that element in the codomain came from under f. So basically it means that the range covers the whole codomain. Okay, so we can write that as for all y in our codomain, there exists an x in the domain such that uh, y is equal to f of x. And then a function is said to be bijective if it is both injective and surjective. So a function is said to be bijective if for all y in the codomain there exists a unique x in the domain such that y is equal to f of x. Okay, so you see the injectivity coming in and that there exists a unique x. Um, good, okay, so if we go back to the kind of example we had back here, and let's just do it over here. If we think about an injective function, so now it's a function and it's injective. Um, the, um, the domain and the codomain are the real line. Uh, a function which is not injective, we can just take that s and turn it on its side in this way. Okay, this is not an injective function because um, for a particular value of f of x here, which is in the range, we have three possibilities, three values of x, one, two, three, that that function could have come from. So it's not an injective function. Surjective just means that the range is equal to the codomain and bijective if both of those hold. So what we'll do is we'll conclude this module with a fairly simple but interesting example. And that example will, it will serve to show you a little bit about what you can do with these definitions of injectivity and surjectivity. So let's think about maps, functions, maps. And let's think about inverses of functions. So intuitively, if we think of a function that takes elements from x onto y or into y, then the inverse of that map goes in the opposite direction. The inverse would take elements from y and map that back to x. So it does the reverse of what the function is doing. Uh, but we can be more precise. We can do the following. We can prove that Um, f, if we had a function f, f has a, and I'm going to define this in a minute, a left inverse, and I'll call it gl, l for left inverse, is equivalent to f being 
injective. So is equivalent to F is injective. Okay, so the double implies, remember, is if and only if. This is true if this is true and vice versa. This is true if this is true. Okay, so what's a left inverse? I gave you a little bit of intuition about a general inverse, but we define a left inverse as follows. Left inverse. So suppose we have a function, and I'm just gonna use the notation we introduced, f maps x into y, and we're going to define something called an identity map. So this is a function and I'm gonna call it one sub x to represent the identity map on the set x. Okay, so it means it maps x back to itself, and if you, um, if you operate on a point little x in x, you'll get back exactly the same point that you started with. So we define the left inverse of the function f to be a map, and we'll use this notation, gl, which maps y back to x, so it maps the codomain back to the domain, and it has the property that if you compose this map with f on the left, so gl composed with f on the left, that's equal to the identity map on x. So this little circle here means map composition. And we recall with map composition, how does this work? This is a function, and it means that f first operates on an element of the domain of f, so it operates on an element in x, and it gives us an element over in y, and then you apply gl. So this comes second, and it takes that element in y, and it maps it back to x again. Okay, so then the definition of a left inverse is that if you take that suppose it inverse, and you compose it on the left with f, you get back the identity map, which basically means that if you start with an element in the domain, you'll end up with that same element again. Okay, so our task here is proving that f ha if f has a left inverse, gl, then f is injective, and vice versa. Okay, so the way to do this, whenever you're stuck, whenever you're faced with um, a proof like this, where you have to prove both, you've got to prove this double implies, you have to basically prove both directions. You have to start with this assumption and then prove this is true, and then you have to start with this assumption and prove that this is true. So we're going to start, uh, let's start with this assumption. F is injective, and then let's prove that F has a left inverse. So um, I'm actually starting the opposite way. So I, I, I write that like this, so proof proof of this. And this just uh, tells me the direction of the proof that I'm taking first. So we're assuming that f is injective. So what does it mean for f to be injective? We just go back to the definition. It means that f of x1 is equal to f of x2 implies that x1 is equal to x2. And now I'm going to construct a map GL and I'm gonna construct it. I know what I want GL to be, so I'm gonna construct it in the following way. Um, it has to be a function, so that's the stipulation, but I'll construct it from F's codomain back to F's domain, so the domain of GL is the codomain of F, and it's constructed such that when G operates on the range of F such that, so we write that as, on f of x, gl operating on those elements of f of x is just equal to x. Okay, so it seems like I've just constructed this map by definition, I haven't proven anything. But basically what I need to prove here, so I, I can say anything I want, but this is only well defined if it's a function. And so then I have to look at this construction and say, well, is it well-defined? Why is that a function? And I look at that and I say, basically, the only way this can be well-defined is if the map F itself is injective. Because if F were not injective, then that inverse would not be well-defined. There may be many possible um, values that it would go to, and then it wouldn't satisfy the definition of a function. So 
What we say here is that the existence of such a well-defined map or um, the ability to construct this map, which is well-defined, is, um, is only possible because f is injective. Then I can construct, if, basically what I want to say is that if f is injective, then this construction is valid. It yields a valid function gl. So we can summarize that by saying gl is a well-defined function because, because f is injective. And that completes that direction of the proof. To prove the other direction is a bit easier. Um, it, it sort of comes automatically. So let's just erase our definition of left inverse and we'll prove the other direction. So that we write as proving the forward direction. So now we're assuming that f, ha f has a left inverse and we want to show that f is injective. All right, so if f has a left inverse, just by definition, gl composed with f, let's call it gl, gl composed with f is the identity map on x. And so what that means is for all x in our space x, gl operating on f of x is equal to x. Okay, so now I want to prove that f is injective. Well, sometimes it's easier, and I think this is one of the cases where it is easier, to do such a proof by um, assuming that it's not injective and then deriving some kind of contradiction. So here, if f were not injective, so we've assumed that this is true, now we're assuming that f is not injective. Assume f is not injective then what would happen? Um, that means that there exists a point x1 and x2 not equal to each other such that, so the opposite of injective would mean that f of x1 is equal to f of x2 because it's not injective. And so now we look at what happens to this map GL here. So on these points, GL, of f of x1 is equal to x1. And similarly, gl of f of x2 is equal to x2. Um, but gl was assumed to be a function. And so that means that x1 is equal to x2 since gl is a function, is a function. And that contradicts our assumption. So I write basically the two arrows pointing at each other indicates a contradiction. Okay, so what we've done here is an example of using injectivity to derive what we call a left inverse GL. We can also derive a right inverse, and we won't go through all the, all the same uh, properties of a right inverse, but we can just um, state the example. So we define a right inverse, and we'll call it GR, to be an inverse map which composes with f on the right to give us the identity map. So here, it's a map such that f composed with gr is equal to the identity map, and now that's going to be the identity map on y. Because remember, we start, when we look at composition, we start with gr, gr maps from y to x, so gr operates on a point y, it gives us something over in the domain of f, which is an element of x, and then f operates on gr of y to give us something back in y. So a right inverse is defined as a function gr such that that composition is true. And similarly, we can prove that if um, f has a right inverse, 
gr. That's true if and only if f is surjective. And we won't prove that. That's an exercise to prove. So finally, let's conclude this module by just saying that now we've talked about injectivity, and that's equivalent to having a left inverse. Surjectivity, equivalent to having a right inverse. Suppose you had a map um, F which had both a left inverse and a right inverse. So let's call it G and let's use our standard notation of F inverse. So G is both a left and right inverse. So we call this the inverse, the true inverse, the full inverse of the map F. And based on the results that we've just proven or we've stated in the previous one that we proved, we can state that G, the existence of this map F inverse. So F has an inverse if it's both injective and surjective, which means it's bijective. So this is where we get to the familiar result that the existence of an inverse is true if and only if the map is bijective. So F is bijective, bijective, if and only if F inverse exists. Okay, so what have we done? We've defined a map, we've defined a map or a function. Um, we've talked about properties of that map, so what makes it a function. Uh, we define the notation around the function, and then we define the important properties of injectivity, surjectivity, and bijectivity. And we concluded with a nice example which introduced you to the concept of an inverse of a map, and we showed a bit of a proof technique that we'll be using throughout the modules in this course. So with that, we'll conclude this first module, and um, thank you very much.